concept we're going to talk about in this video is called homeostasis. Now it's something that we're going to talk about several times throughout the semester. So you need to make sure that you understand the concept because we're going to carry it. I'm going to ask you several questions about it as we go through the semester. Definition of homeostasis is the maintenance of a stable internal environment even with changes in the external environment. So even, thing, even though things are changing around you in, in the external environment, and even if you're bringing things in from the external into the internal, your internal environment is going to stay consistent. Now, what that means is that you have to stay within a small range of acceptable values to maintain a healthy life. And let me give you an example. Let's use body temperature. What you're going to see, and I'll draw several of these throughout the semester, is there's going to be a small range of acceptable values that your body has to stay in in order to maintain health and to maintain life. And in the middle of the high and low values is what we call a set point. So what your body is always trying to do is to keep the values in this range. The easiest example is body temperature. Your set point for body temperature is around 98.6. What starts to happen is, it, let's say you go outside and it's really hot, your body temperature will start to go up. But it has to stay below this range in order to be healthy. So what happens is you'll start to sweat. And when you start to sweat, that will bring your body temperature down. Another example is if you go outside and it's really cold out, your body temperature will start to go down. Now you have to stay above this level right here or else it becomes unhealthy. You can go into hypothermia and you can actually die if you go too far below this line. So what will happen is your body will make changes to try to keep your body temperature from going down too far. One example would be shivering. As you start to shiver, it starts to bring your body temperature up. When your muscles contract, they generate heat and that brings your body temperature up. So you have a small range of acceptable values that your body has to stay between. Now this is the same example for many different variables, blood sugar, oxygen levels, carbon dioxide, blood pressure, water levels, sodium levels, chloride levels in your body. We call this process a dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic means movement or changing, and equilibrium means the same. So they don't seem like two terms that should go together, but they do. Equilibrium means you're staying between these two levels. You're staying between these two lines. That's equilibrium. Dynamic means your body can change in order to stay between those two levels. So like I gave you here, your body can sweat. That's change. That's movement. That causes your body temperature to go down. When your body temperature starts to get to the lower end, again, dynamic means your body has a way of changing it. Shivering is an example, and shivering will bring your body temperature up. I'll show you another example that you can actually see next time in class. Now there are three parts to a homeostatic mechanism. first part are called receptors. Receptors are going to provide information about your sugar level, about your blood pressure, about your carbon dioxide levels, about body temperature. And receptors are going to send signals to the control center. The control center usually is your brain. There are different parts of your brain that are going to be the control center. There's one part called the hypothalamus that we'll talk about. It actually determines the set point of your body temperature of 98.6. And then the third part are called effectors. They cause a response that changes the environment to maintain homeostasis. So receptors respond to changes. They provide information to the control center. The control center then notices that you're going towards or away from set point, and then it sends a response to the effectors, which brings your body back towards set point. Here's a little more visual way of seeing that. So here are receptors. So your body temperature starts to go down. Your blood sugar starts to go down. Your oxygen levels start to go down. These receptors send signals to the control center in your brain. Your brain then says, OK, we're going away from set point, and it sends out a response to the effectors, which make a change and keep you in that range that we talked about. Now, there are two types of homeostatic mechanisms. One I've already talked about. I just haven't put a definition on it, but now we're going to do that. First type is called a negative feedback mechanism. What this means is the conditions move away from set point, responses are made, by the body to move it back towards set point. So let me go on to the next page. I'll come back to positive feedback in a second. But it's exactly what I showed you. 
This is a negative feedback mechanism. Here's your set point in the center. Here's your high value. Here's your low value. Your body has to keep the variable in this range. As your body temperature goes up, your body moves to bring it down. And notice we're coming back towards set point. Again, set point is right here. As your body temperature starts to go down, your body moves to make it go back towards set point. As your blood sugar goes up, your body moves to bring it down towards set point. As your blood sugar goes down, your body moves to go up towards set point. So we're always coming back towards set point. But what I want you to notice is that you spend very little time exactly at set point. You're spending most of your time going towards set point. So that's a negative feedback mechanism. Now the second one, which is not as common, over 95% of the feedback mechanisms in your body are negative. Now, negative does not mean bad, it's good. Positive feedback mechanisms are rare, but we also need them in order to survive. And the definition is, as conditions move away from set point, responses keep the conditions going away from set point until we accomplish a goal. So you're only going to see positive feedback mechanisms in, in special situations and they only exist for a period of time and then they shut down. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to give you some examples. Okay. One example is labor contractions when a woman is giving birth. What will happen is the fetus will start to send signals to the woman's brain saying that it's ready to be born. And that will cause the woman's brain to secrete a hormone called oxytocin. And what oxytocin does from the brain, one of the things it does, is it causes the contraction of the uterus. Now as oxytocin causes contraction of the uterus, as the uterus contracts, that sends more signals to the brain to send more oxytocin. More oxytocin, more contractions, more contractions, more oxytocin. So what happens is you go away from set point and that keeps going until what happens? Until the baby's born and then it's shut off. So here's your set point. We're going away from set point until we accomplish our goal and then it shuts off. Another example is blood clotting. Let's say you get a cut. How is a cut, how do we stop it from bleeding? There's several ways, but the first way is you have these little part, they're not complete cells, but they're called platelets. And what happens is, let's say you get a cut, okay, so here you've been cut and you're bleeding. What's going to happen is one platelet's going to come in and it's going to stick to it. And that one platelet is then going to cause three more platelets to stick. Those three platelets cause more platelets, more platelets, more platelets, more platelets, until what happens? Until we have what's called a platelet plug which helps stop the bleeding. So one platelet signals more platelets with signals more platelets until you've got all these platelets that are sticking here to help stop the bleeding. Now once the bleeding is stopped, what do we need to happen? We need the feedback mechanism to shut off. So it's like here when the baby was born, then we need it to shut off. When the bleeding is stopped, we need it to shut off. So a positive feedback mechanism Again, if conditions move away from set point, the response keeps it going away from set point again until we accomplish a goal and then it shuts itself off. The key there is that it has to shut itself off. Now there are two main systems of the body that cause homeostatic changes. We're going to briefly go over them. We'll cover them more in depth as we go through the semester. The first one is the nervous system and I've already mentioned this. Um, you have receptors throughout your body your brain and spinal cord your brain and spinal cord are your control center especially your brain so the nervous system makes really quick changes to maintain homeostasis so you walk into a room you turn the lights on your pupils are going to constrict you turn the lights off your pupils are going to dilate your CO2 levels change in your body, which you don't even can't feel. Your brain's going to cause changes to maintain homeostasis. And we'll spend a whole, you're going to have a whole big test on the nervous system, so we'll go through the parts of it more closely later on. The second system you may not be as familiar with, it's called the endocrine system. The endocrine system, in lab, you're going to learn some different glands. Let me change my color here.
So you have different glands that you talked about. You have the pituitary gland, which you will learn about with the nervous system. You have your thyroid gland. You have your adrenal glands that sit above the kidneys, your pancreas, which you've probably heard about in terms of blood sugar. Um, in females, we have ovaries. In males, testes. These are all glands. What the endocrine system does is it makes changes to maintain homeostasis, but it, do, it makes them slower than the nervous system, but their changes last much longer. So you have an influence all over the body. So you have a hormone up here coming from the pituitary gland that actually can influence all cells throughout the whole body. They flow through the bloodstream until they bond with cells. So the endocrine system works slower than the nervous system, but it's still relatively quick. Um, an example would be when you have a fight or flight response with a high stress, your adrenal glands will release adrenaline. That adrenaline is going to work pretty quickly, not as fast as the nervous system, and it's going to influence cells throughout the whole body. So here's just an example of a, uh, just a quick system here to show you how it works. You have glands that secrete hormones. Okay, so glands secrete hormones in response to some kind of change. The hormones will flow through the bloodstream and they will come in contact with cells. Now they don't have a response on every cell, but they come close to cells and if the cell has a receptor on it that the hormone can fit to, then it will bind to the cell membrane and I'll show you an example of that in a second. And what that does is when that hormone binds to the cell membrane, it causes changes in the cell that help maintain homeostasis. So here's an example. Here's a cell. Here are what are called receptor proteins, which we'll talk about later. And here's a hormone. Okay, here's a hormone. What ha happens is, pretend this is the, pretend this area here is your bloodstream. The hormone travels through the bloodstream, and if it can fit to a receptor in a cell, it will. And when it binds to that receptor, what happens is changes go on within the cell. Okay. And those changes that go on within the cell are going to help the cell maintain homeostasis. So again, hormones can influence cells throughout the whole body. Anywhere they can bind to, they can cause a change. What happens when homeostasis is not maintained? Well, if you get out of the range, and let me draw the range in again. If you draw your range, your low and your high, you've got your set point here. If you get out of this range, if you get out of this range, we call it a disease. Someone with diabetes, what happens is their blood sugar can get out of this range. And if it goes too high or too low, or if they can't maintain their blood sugar, then they have the disease diabetes. What happens if you get way out of this range? Let's say a diabetic, a diabetic blood sugar goes way below this range. What happens is their nervous system doesn't have any fuel. Your nervous system needs glucose. So if your blood glucose goes way too low, it can put you in a coma and you can die from that. Just like with body temperature. If your body temperature goes too low, you can die of hypothermia. If your body temperature goes too high, you can die of heat stroke. So again, if you're outside the range, then you have a disease. That disease can sometimes lead to death. In the case of diabetes, what you hope happens is with the use of insulin and proper diet and exercise that even with diabetes that you can maintain your blood sugar in the normal range. That's the end of this video on homeostasis. Again, if you need to go back to fill in your notes, go ahead and do that and watch it a second time.